Coming up on Tech News Today, Apple's dumping Intel. Does Microsoft have a gaming tablet? Instagram discovered the web. No, Instagram really did discover the web. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, November 6, 2012, Election Day. Tech News Today is brought to you by ShareFile. Enhance your workflow, send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile by Citrix. Try ShareFile today for a 30-day free trial. Go to ShareFile.com, click the radio microphone, and enter TNT. And by Ring Central. We do everything in the cloud. That's why we love our cloud-based phone system by Ring Central. Zero startup costs and Ring Central is $20 a month per user. Try it now with a 30-day risk-free trial. Buy one desk phone and get a second phone free up to 20 phones. Call 800 543 9 9980 or visit ringcentral.com and use our promo code TWIT. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphones. Find out what your gadget is worth and get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zachter. And I'm Jason Howell. Joining us, Father Robert Ballas. Sarah will be uh, jumping in on the discussion Ooh. in a few minutes. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me back. It's like an early Thanksgiving, but with less tryptophan. And more voting. Oh. Uh, but let's start off with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feeds. I cast my vote for the Bloomberg story. Uh, Bloomberg reports that no less than three people with knowledge of the work say Apple is exploring using ARM-based chips in its laptops and desktops. While the engineers at Apple don't see a switch happening for a few years, according to Bloomberg, they also think it's inevitable. Apple uses ARM-based chips in the iPhone and the iPad right now. Halo 4 was unleashed to the masses today at midnight, and the critics are giving it Two thumbs up, and in some cases, even more than that. After reports of repetitive gameplay and the same old enemies and, oh, the environments are all the same, a sort of this-again attitude hung over the press push at E3 2012. That was when Halo 4 led Microsoft's press conference, but CNET calls it a must-buy. So you know what that means. Get out there and vote. How many thumbs do these people have? Lots of thumbs. Well, it's Halo, so well, they're aliens, not right? many. <laughs> <laughs> How much would you pay for Amazon Prime on a monthly basis? Eight dollars. Well, yeah, Amazon agrees with you, Tom. Oh, okay. And it's testing out an eight dollar a month <laughs> option for Amazon Prime. This service would give you access to Amazon's instant video library and that whole upgraded shipping service. While it would cost more on the year, about ninety six dollars compared to the yearly eighty dollar fee. It could be quite enticing to new customers. Instagram took forever to add Android support to its popular iOS service, but it's taken even longer to add the older, more widespread World Wide Web platform. You may be familiar with it. You're probably using it right now. Uh, that long worldwide nightmare is over, though. Instagram announced web profiles that allow users to comment, like photos, and edit their profile information. Microsoft Surface RT tablet offers twice as much storage as the iPad at the same <gasps> 499 price point, 32 gigs versus 16 gigs, so it's better unless you actually want to use 32 gigabytes. Microsoft has clarified that only about half of those 32 gigabytes is free for users to access because the total disk size is really about 29 gigabytes and then Windows RT, Microsoft Office apps, other built-in apps are another eight gigabytes and then five gigabytes more for Windows recovery tools and you're left with 16 or so gigabytes of free space out of the box. So Twice as much space. Nobody's better than anyone else. We're all equal. Everyone wins forever. the election. We all win. RT <laughs> it's a or not. I hate math. <laughs> Some of you Tech News Today Redditors are all excited about this next story. The BBC micro game Elite is back as a Kickstarter project. The game is called Elite Dangerous and is looking to raise 1.25 million British pounds. Right now it's at over 200,000 pounds. The guy behind the Kickstarter project, oh by the way, it's David Brabin, who happens to be one of the original developers of Elite. He says Elite Dangerous is the game that he wanted to make for a very long time. Apple lodged a lawsuit against Motorola in March 2011, claiming the mobile company was charging unreasonably high rates for patent licenses at 2.25% for each phone sold. As the case neared trial today, Judge Barbara Crabb 
dismissed it with prejudice, leaving the question unresolved. The case was dismissed because Apple would not commit to abide by the court's decision. So Judge Crabb said, well, there's no reason to have a trial then. Microsoft has a similar case against Motorola set to go to trial November 13th. Get an Amazon locker at Staples and get your online shopping packages sent there. Go Amazon. Lakers. <laughs> It's not. <laughs> that's different. Well, oh, sorry. never mind. Never mind. <laughs> Amazon has sent storage units uh, set up at grocery stores, convenience stores, and drug stores. Many of them open 24 hours, so that's convenient. The point is trying to let customers avoid having to wait for ordered packages due to a missed delivery. Amazon sends customers an email with a pickup code, which is entered on a touch screen to open the locker containing the package. Shoppers then have three days from the delivery date to pick up the package or else it self-destructs. <laughs> and blows up staples. So don't <laughs> let that happen, people. Pick up your package. Unless you don't like the Lakers. And it, I, right. I'm, yeah, I'm a not lot saying people anything here. I'm just, I'm just letting that happen. Kind hang. of the Yankees of basketball. Uh, chip design competition just got really complicated, so try and follow me here. GPU designer Imagination Technologies will buy CPU architect MIPS for $60 million U.S. The iPhone 5 uses a GPU based on Imagination Designs. MIPS CPU designs are used in networking equipment and digital TV. Now, this logically looks like Imagination gearing up to take on ARM. However, part of this deal sees Imagination and Allied Security Trust taking 498 of MIPS non-processor patents and creating a new holding company called Bridge Crossing. One of the leading investors in Bridge Crossing, ARM. Okay, I'm gonna put my brain back into my head because yeah. it just exploded. New Jersey is like allowing staples. New Jersey is allowing its citizens to vote via email or fax so they can participate in today's election. Some experts are weighing in, and they are afraid of miscounts and that email voting could remove the ability to vo to vote in secret. Princeton University professor Andrew Apel called email voting insecure and cited concerns of spoofing. Matthew Blaze, a secure systems expert, is concerned that the system may be subject to crashed email servers and denial of service attacks. By the way, go vote today. Yeah. Uh, this episode of Tech News Today brought to you by ShareFile from Citrix. When you email a file, you're not just sending it. You're, 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 you're giving over your personal information. You're giving over confidential information. You're secure. We're just talking about email. You want to send your confidential, secure information through EFA? Well, maybe the people at, uh, doing the voting should check out ShareFile. It opens up a world of possibilities. Rather than an attachment, your file is sent as a secure link that allows you to collaborate and share information to get work done. Now, you may say, well, wait a minute now. i got to use some weird service. It's separate from email attachments. The thing about ShareFile is it's dead simple. It integrates with Outlook. And to people on the other end, it acts as if, they're getting a normal email with an attachment. It's just a lot more secure. They click a link, they get the file, they open it up. They don't have to do anything on their end unless you want to password protect it. You can do that. Uh, and you can also track whether they opened it, how many times they opened it. You can control who opens it. You can use it for collaboration. Uh, ShareFile allows you to access your files remotely from your laptop, your tablet, or your smartphone. I use it uh, when I have something that uh, legal documents, financial documents that I just don't want to throw out there on the open internet and an email attachment. I want to keep them secure and I want to be able to pull them off. Once, you know, my CPA has gotten the financial transactions, I can actually then take that file away and say, okay, he's got it. Let's make sure nobody else can get it. Try share file today. You don't have to take my word for it. Sign up with this special offer, a full 30 day free trial. Go to sharefile.com, click on the radio microphone, and enter TNT. Remember, visit sharefile.com and type in TNT. And we thank Citrix and Sharefile for their support of Tech News Today. All right, joining us today on Election Day is Mr. Father. Mr. Father. I guess that you're works. just, it's just Father Mr. Robert. Father. <laughs> <Padre>. <laughs> Mystery Father. Yeah. Uh, Father Robert Ballester, host of the This Week in Enterprise Tech, back with us. Thank you, uh, thank you for joining us. Oh, for sticking around. Thank you for inviting day. me back. Yeah, yeah especially no, we always, after that last time. So, mm. <laughs> always love that. Yeah, I know. Uh, let's start off with talking about this idea of Apple switching from Intel to Mac. We, we mentioned it in the news views. Uh, Bloomberg reporting that engineers. Uh, three three engineers who had knowledge of the matter. Is that it? I Something like that. Anyway, uh, three knowledge. people with knowledge of the work. That's what it was. Uh, the idea is that Apple w is investigating right now. They're doing prototypes, which is probably true. They're always doing all kinds of experiments uh, to see if they can run OS X on ARM and build laptops and desktops 
that have ARM chips and just switch entirely off of Intel. There were interesting things to keep in mind when we discussed this. Bob Mansfield was recently put in charge of a technology group responsible for chip design. Uh, they have always wanted to unify the experience uh, and having the same chip in all of their products would make it easier to unify that consumer experience, that end user experience. And ARM just introduced the first 64-bit ARM cores last month. And one thing you have to have for a MacBook Pro is a 64-bit processor if you want to be able to handle all the RAM that people want to put into their machines. Elbrus Technologies has developed emulation technologies that allows an ARM chip to run software developed for Intel x86 chips so they could make a Rosetta-type situation if they did switch to ARM. Now, here's the question. Eric Hesedel says... Is this just negotiating time for Apple, and that's why this is leaked out to Bloomberg? Are they trying to get a better deal with Intel? I don't think so. Uh, one of Apple's core tenets has always been to own the technologies that really drive their products. I mean, that's why they're they're switching manufacturers. That's why they design their own chip. So I think there is at least a faction within Apple that says this would be a good idea. Not only would we be able to unify the platforms, but we could own the technology that drives our products. The problem is... Anyone in the chat room will know this. ARM chips just aren't there for the desktop. They're really good for mobile because they're fantastically efficient with power. But the minute you try to emulate something like an operating system or a, a suite of software, it slows all the way down and you lose all your efficiencies because you have to run the, the, the chip that much faster to actually do the instruction set translation. Well, it's a balance. So this is a really good point because I think this. what is most interesting about this story is it applies not just to Apple, but it applies to anybody making a computer. ARM is balancing power efficiency against power. I Intel's thing right now is we make the most powerful chips. They may not be the most power efficient, but we're trying to work on that with Atom. ARM's designs are the most power efficient chips, but there's no reason that someone couldn't take the ARM reference design and create a more powerful chip. And if Apple were the ones to do that, what would that do to Intel? Force them to bring down prices, certainly. It could devastate. Yeah, I mean, it could it could bring down prices. It could also bring down the company. Yeah. I think. Well, I mean, because that's 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 what they have, right? It's like, well, we're not the most power efficient, maybe, but for power users, what else are you going to do? You got to pay a premium for that. Yeah, but well, that's one of the reasons why Intel's trying to get in the mobile space anyway. There's nothing stopping Intel from licensing an ARM architecture and just doing it themselves and remaining the manufacturer if they wanted to in Apple products or other products. That's a crazy scenario. But they have said in the past that if the right customer came along that wanted them to make an ARM processor, they'd do it. I mean, for Apple to make this kind of move would require a huge shift. It'd probably like maybe like OS 11. We would say this line in the sand where if you wanted to emulate the old version of this, that's not going to work because ARM is, like, like Father Robert saying, ARM is okay. But when Apple made uh, their switch, they emulated PowerPC with Intel because it had enough power for that. ARM's not going to be able to do that even if 64 cores or not or whatever they're going to do, crazy things. I think there's a 48 core processor coming, all kinds of matic ideas. But it, I don't think it can possibly do the same kind of things that the current uh, suite of desktop apps can do. Although Apple does have that app store. So they can simply say, look, just recompile your code. It's going to run on ARM. It's going to run fine. But it's... I think it's a long ways away. Ishai uh, asks, well, how would this bring down Intel? It's just OS X. My, my proposition here is not, is not that it's just OS X that brings down Intel. It's that Apple proves that you could make, if the Apple were to prove you could make a powerful ARM chip uh, at, a, at a, a cheaper rate, all of a sudden everybody running Windows would also start running uh, ARM processors and, and Windows RT could be beefed up by Microsoft. Uh, and, and again, we're talking something that happens over several years here. And I think, I, I wish I could find the uh, person in the chat room who pointed out, oh, here it is, Web1703, so you're anonymous. Intel could build ARM chips, you know? So this, this, they, this, could, this could actually just change the landscape. Uh, Intel could license the ARM design and say, well, we're still the best at building chips. Yeah, I just said that. Uh, and we'll yeah. do that. Uh, you, you said that too. Mm -hmm. so, and, and something else about Intel is that, yeah, this would be a big hit. Apple is a big customer. They're a big single customer. But Apple still makes up a relatively small portion of Intel sales. They sell more processors to Google than they sell to Apple. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's a hit, but it's not something that I don't, I don't think it would destroy the company in the near term. In the long term, if, if Apple's approach with ARM takes off, then, yeah, it could really put a dent into Intel sales. There is another wild card, and that is... If Apple is willing to basically 
will screw over their customers and say, okay, nothing up to this point will work anymore. We're going to re-engineer the operating system. We're going to re-engineer all the software. You have to buy it again, and it's all been optimized for ARM, which they could do. Then this is a definitely doable. Yeah. Uh, intriguing proposition. Also an intriguing proposition is that Microsoft already has a gaming tablet. Because we were already in the rumor mill, weren't we? Yeah. Let's go back. Yeah, let's anyway. go back. So, The Verge is reporting that a smaller Surface uh, tablet is on the horizon. They're citing multiple sources familiar with plans within Redmond. So it's a different set of different, sources. <laughs> different uh, title. That Microsoft's building a 7-inch Xbox Surface. Now, this is likely to have an ARM processor, go figure, high bandwidth RAM for gaming. Although the specs could be altered to handle Intel system on chips, uh, or systems on a chip, uh, Xbox Surface would not run a full version of Windows. It'd run a custom Windows kernel. According to The Verge, part of the Xbox Surface is being developed at Microsoft's offices in Silicon Valley. Apparently, those offices have been pretty locked down, very hard to get into, hard to get images out of there. And the rumors of the has, have people been trying to climb into the windows of the windows. Of the, <laughs> well, and most most of the Silicon Valley offices are just wide open. They just won't let me in. Just walk right Tried in. Tried to walk in. They said I wasn't an employee. More locked down than normal, I guess. I don't know if there if there if there's a bouncer at the door. Uh, the rumors of the Xbox Surface appeared back in June before the uh, the Surface was even introduced. So a dedicated portable gaming device for Microsoft. You know, everyone's been talking about an Xbox portable for a while. You know, that's something that could be interesting. Does the rumor sound plausible, or does and what about the fact that it'd be Xbox specific and not Windows? After all the work Microsoft's done about Windows 8 and tablets, that this device would be Xbox specific. I think it's a really strange move. Well, I guess it depends on what the price would be at the point that they start retailing it. I mean, I, I agree with you. It's like, gosh, it's not a full version of Windows. The Surf, what? But again, we talk all the time about how the Xbox brand is is strong. People love their Xboxes. There's, there's a lot you can do with an Xbox. The idea of having a mobile version of the gaming platform that you already love, I'm sure is very attractive to people. But yeah, I mean, you can't have it just competing with a regular Surface. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. What, I, what I like about this is, you know, if you've got a Windows 8 tablet or a Surface tablet, you've already got that Project Glass and you've got the ability to play, you know, Xbox Live games. So what, what they're trying to do is to leverage the popularity of their gaming system into a, a dedicated device. We've seen that work before with something like the Kindle. Now the question is, Again, I, I think Sarah's absolutely right about this, is the price point. If you can get something down to, say, a $200 price point for a dedicated uh, device that is basically Project Glass for, uh, um, uh, for a tablet, then, yeah, it will sell. Uh, if you're going to sell a $600 tablet that only does Xbox gaming, then it's dead on arrival. I, I don't know if it is or it isn't. It, it all depends on how it's marketed and whether people pick up on that marketing. The idea of Sony coming out with the PSP wasn't considered dead on arrival. And that's exactly what this is. It's just larger. It's They're, they're saying, we're going to make an Xbox that's a tablet and that's portable. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of coming at it the other way, going like, yeah, but you make a tablet that runs Windows 8. So why would you hamstring it and not have it run the same kernel? But the fact of the matter is, if you look at it as, hey, get an Xbox but in a portable form factor, all of a sudden that sounds really exciting and cool. Yeah, and if they can get the price point low enough, it's a very appealing concept because Xbox Smart Glass works on like pretty much any device anyway. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's not running Windows anyway. It could be on Windows 8. It can be iOS, Android eventually. These, that kind of support is nice, but if Microsoft has its own dedicated device, and again, the Surface is supposed to be basically a showcase. This is the kind of products that people could make for our, for our ecosystem. This is going to work really well. Why not have your own thing? Even though it's, it, as long as it has more functions than just Xbox, that's where I think it gets a little strange because when people look at that Wii U tablet, people, they're like, well, you can't really use it for much more than the Wii. But it's bundled with the Wii. This right. would not be bundled with well, an Xbox. It would be an Xbox. We don't know that either like. way. If it'll yeah. come with the 720 or whatever they're going to call the next one. So it, I, I doubt it would be bundled in because the price would be probably pretty high. But if, if they can make a device that has multiple functionalities beyond Xbox, I think it could be a hit. And I, I, then you could use Project Glass, uh, not not the Google Project Glass, the smart but, the, glass right? but the Smart Glass, sorry. Uh, and then you could run your Microsoft Surface RT and your Xbox next to each other. Right. Actually, Tefman in, in the chat room had an interesting point, which is, well, what if we just don't call it a tablet? We just call it an X, a flat Xbox with a screen. Yeah, right. It, it, it is a dedicated device. People would would pay, you know, 500 bucks for the next generation Xbox that also comes with a screen that can also be integrated into your, your Microsoft network at home. That actually would be kind of interesting. And that's new. That's, that's something that no one's ever done before. Pretty nifty stuff.
Also nifty is the World Wide Web, and apparently Instagram just discovered that it ha exists. Yeah, their uh, web profiles for Instagram users are rolling out this week. Some users already have them. I am not one of those users, sadly. But basically, whatever your Instagram name is, if you're already an Instagram user, if you go to Instagram.com slash your username, that will be your new little place on the web. And my first thought when I looked at some of the user profiles that are already live was, well, this is kind of cool. You've got this big, almost uh, cover photo type uh, mosaic of pictures up top based on pictures that you've taken uh, uh, relatively recently. And then below your name and your profile photo and how many people are following you, you've got a, a list of your uh, most recent photos in, in chronological order. If you click on any of those, works just like uh, any of the Instagram apps would. You can see who's commented and liked. You can do the same. You could do all that straight from the web. Now, you have been able to comment and like Instagram photos from photo permalinks. Yeah. Permalinks have been around for a while. Like through Twitter, you get those Exactly. Yeah. But not actually a profile page. So this is, in, in my opinion, not only does it kind of look like a Facebook timeline, but it's a little bit of a, well, it works like a lot of other Facebook properties, I guess you would say. I mean, you've got now an opportunity for a brand to have not just an Instagram profile. You know, like I I, um, I followed the San Francisco Giants Instagram uh, account, for example. They take a lot of good pictures. I like almost all of them. It'd be kind of nice, though, for them to have just a place on the web. That's easier for a lot of people to remember rather than open up Instagram, hit the explore button, type in who you think you're trying to follow, see what comes up, and find them that way. So in a way, because Instagram obviously eventually is going to want to try to monetize this, this seems like a very good place. You want a landing page, not just for people, but also for brands, maybe a little bit like pages versus profiles in Facebook. Facebook and Instagram, both sides have said, even though the Instagram employees now work at Facebook headquarters, we're still two different companies. Instagram does their thing. Facebook does their thing. The fact that Instagram now has a blue header and uh, authorized application screen that looks almost exactly like Facebook's is total coincidence? Well, it's not coincidence. Yeah. Hey, they are, Facebook is the parent company, but both, bo both entities say we are still going to run separately. And actually... It, it looks like that's the case because Facebook, at least for iOS, just got an update that adds photo filters and ability to batch upload and all sorts of stuff that, in a way, is almost a competitor to Instagram. The Instagram, or the, the, the Facebook, and this is only for the iOS app, not the Android app, at least as of yet, the, f the filters have different names, so it's not exactly the same as Instagram, but it's definitely the same idea. And what the Facebook app does do, and this is actually something that the Facebook camera app has been doing since May when it rolled out, because they have a standalone app just for photos, is the ability for me to say, okay, all uh, five of us went out to lunch to the Mexican restaurant and I took five pictures, so I'm gonna upload those as a batch rather than just one by one. Can't do that on Instagram, at least not now. Mm -hmm. So it's almost as if, depending on the kind of pictures you take and what you want to share on Facebook, if you're already sharing Instagram pictures to Facebook regularly, like me, I might not always want to use Instagram because the Facebook app has filters too, and I have some other features. So you know, I don't know. They're they're uh, they're just they're just building out photo apps right and left. Of course, I, they win either way, right? Yeah. Because if you if you use Instagram, you use Facebook, you're in you're in the company now. Sure. Yeah, I think Facebook thinks. Why don't we make it easier for people to access Instagram, open up web profiles? Why not? We'll get some more users that way. Already got a lot of users. And meanwhile, the Facebook app for people who, for whatever reason, don't like Instagram. We had Sasha on the show yesterday. He was like, I hate Instagram. Well, I mean, He hates I the filters <laughs> specifically. He hates the filters specifically. I but I think a lot of that is people saying, Instagram, that's the hipster app. I don't like that. I don't want to use it. But every once in a while, if you take out, uh, you take a photo, it's a little blown out, you add a filter and you're like, oh, actually you can see the billboard I was trying to take a picture of, that's better. And filters aren't always the worst thing in the world. I was taking a look at the Instagram sites. A friend of mine has a profile up and I'm seeing it. It's, I mean, it does look a lot like Facebook. It has that large cover image. Jason's got it apparently. I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I don't know why they pushed it out to me. I can edit my profile, but I don't see that. <laughs> so I guess it's just the old profile. Well, well you have to specifically type in Instagram.com slash your username and then you'll know whether you have one or not. You can't like navigate it to it 
Find out if you're the chosen in. one or not. But I mean, yeah, so weird. if you log in, you can't get to your own page. That's right. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. At least I had to type it in manually. I this profile will be available in. soon. Okay. It's yeah, also sort of it. nice how the cover photo, not only is it a collection, but they're dynamic. They're changing. Yep. I mean, we can see them, at least uh, anyone kind of who's like watching the video version. So nice it's not snail. like a co cover Thanks. photo that you have to think about changing regularly, which you do with Facebook. And it's got the perfect interface. Just like I was saying with Pinterest lots of times, where you can just sneak an ad in there. I mean, just have all these squares, right? <laughs> You sneak an ad in there. I'm like, oh, look, there's Rich, and he's doing something cool. There's a pumpkin, and that he likes McDonald's? No, that's a McDonald's ad. Like, it could easily be monetized because you're just scanning. You're not reading the status updates. You're not seeing sponsored posts. Maybe just say something a little bit, you know, You don't even better. know why you're hungry for Taco Bell you're just, suddenly. <laughs> you're just looking at it, and you're scanning by. I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's Instagram, you know, is a different animal than Facebook when it comes to what people use it for, but it seems like this structure is going to be really easy to monetize. Well, I mean, anytime you're talking about a wholly acquired subsidy, um, uh, 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 it, it never lasts. It really does. I mean, you can look down history of, of tech and you look at uh, some of these really cool companies that they were doing something that was that was hip, it was smart, it was cool. They were purchased by a bigger entity and they, they maintained their independence for X number of years before eventually that hipness and that coolness factor wore off and then they were sort of merged into the parent company. I mean, who doesn't see that happening with Instagram at some point? They're in the same business. They, they, they're building communities. They're trying to sell ads to those communities. So eventually, when Instagram's shine rubs off, Facebook is no longer going to be able to justify having it be a, a direct competitor to its own service. I don't know, though. CBS has CW. It's their network. It's another network that does television shows. Why, why wouldn't they just fold it into CBS? Because they can brand it and target different people and then have a chance to move people from one product to the other and back again. And, I, and Facebook might take that approach with Instagram. This is for people who are really into photos. Maybe it is targeted towards hipsters uh, and people who don't really like Facebook. Facebook's for my mom and dad. You know, Instagram is, is for cool kids. Uh, but then they can move people back and forth between those two products. But then why make the two interfaces look so much alike? Nah, I don't because know. if someone jumped from Instagram, if someone only knew Instagram yeah, yeah. And, and just discovered Facebook, they'd say, wait a minute, this copied Instagram. Why don't Maybe I just that's use a good this? thing. So they are like, oh, it's familiar. Yeah, it could be. I don't feel so out of sorts <laughs> over here in this it's strange like country. It's like extra strength bleach. It's better than that other bleach. We make both, but it doesn't matter. There's just more bleach. Yeah. <laughs> now have a cup. Yeah. You might want to look at it. Have a cup. <laughs> Maybe you want to look at it like you know different cars. You know you have Toyota, they have Scion, they have Lexus, right? They can have a similar. There's similar interfaces. You understand how a car works. Yeah, but right. There's more amenities and certain things. Did you want to write text? Well, that's Facebook. Do you not want to see any text? That's Instagram. Do you want this other brand? Yeah, well, we have that too. It's just it just they can keep them separate without it being too awful. All right, let's take a quick break. Thank Ring Central for their support of Tech News Today. They are one of our sponsors. And when we built the studio here, we actually we didn't have them as a sponsor, but we chose them as a product because we didn't want to run a big PBX system in the basement of the Twit Studios. And Russell, our IT guy, said why don't you get a cloud-based phone system and recommended Ring Central? No brainer. Uh, Ring Central is zero startup costs, no hardware to install or maintain, no, no big PBX hardware anyway. I mean, you have to get phones, so you do have to have a little hardware, but it wouldn't be much of a phone system without actual phones. Ring Central allows us to easily customize all of our call handling. You can get your voicemail in your email. Fax messages, if they're there, you know there's people out there that are still trying to send you fax messages. You can get them right on your your smartphone uh, with Ring Central. All all inclusive pricing is as low as twenty dollars a month per user, and you can start right now with a thirty day risk free trial. They have a special offer for our listeners. When you buy one desk phone, you get a second phone free up to 20 phones. So call this number designated for our Twit listeners, 800-543-9980. That's 800-543-9980. Once again, 800-543-9980. Or go to ringcentral.com and use the promo code TWIT. Ringcentral.com, promo code TWIT. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Foursquare is launching a rating system. Now, I've been using Foursquare more and more sort of as a competitor to Urban Spoon, to other discovery apps, a little bit uh, as maybe an alternative to something like Yelp. And this seems to be like they're going directly after it looks Yelp. Like, yeah, it looks like they're coming after Yelp because Foursquare's got a new rating system for locations. It's going to look at several different uh, factors before it comes up with this 10-point uh, scale. It's going to look at tips, likes, dislikes, popularity, loyalty, local expertise, and check-ins to come up with the rating. So if you take a look at a certain place, I think in the video, you're seeing something that has a 9.0 rating out of 10. They're claiming that it's better than a four-star system or whatever, because it's not it's not four, it's got 10. So whatever you want to do with that. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's funny. That, that was one of the weird things in their blog post. 
You'll also find the scores in the Explorer section of the iOS apps. Uh, users can find and can also add scores in that same location. And it's also available on the web. So if you want to take a look how that works, you can actually just go online and find it. I, I find it a lot easier to use on the, I find the ratings easier online than I did on the app. Uh, so so face, Foursquare has made a bunch of changes. You know, they, They've shifted from a gamified check-in app. That's what it used to be like. I got a badge because I showed up to this place or I'm the mayor of this town. Uh, you know, Would this make you use Foursquare more? And should Yelp worry? Because this seems like now it's a more information database than it was before, before it was just this game. I think it makes it more compelling to use Foursquare as a, I want to go somewhere good. Maybe I'm somewhere unfamiliar or maybe I just want something new. Tell me what that is. Because right now, the problem I have with Foursquare is, this always happens at South by Southwest because it's like, here I am in Austin again. And it's a great, this is where Foursquare was born. So I'll load up the app and I'll find out where I should get brunch. And it'll say, this place is popular with your friends because it's based on their check-ins, but not necessarily based on their good experience there. So you get some stuff that rises to the top, but not necessarily because people said, that was the best breakfast I ever had. What you have to do is go in and start reading those reviews. I don't always have time for that. I love the idea of a rating system up top. If I want to drill down and see what specifically should I get, what's the most popular dish, that's fine too. And it sounds like that's what Foursquare is doing, is thinking people are on the go. If I see 9 out of 10, I'm like, hmm, sounds pretty good. Okay, maybe I'll get a little bit more details there, but I'm not forced to... Uh, expand and start reading a lot of reviews that aren't necessarily uh, of interest to me. Father Robert, what do you think? Do you think this is a Yelp competitor or is this just something else? You know, I, I think it's Foursquare trying to figure out what their next step is because the personally, I, I just realized the other day, I haven't checked in on Foursquare for about five months. Uh, and I was really, really in the Foursquare. I, that I, reminds I, me, I need to check in on Foursquare. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I, I, I bought into the check-in system. I bought into the badges. I thought it was a lot of fun. And then I realized... It was just feeding my OCD. Mm -hmm. If they added something that actually gave me some usable information rather than just a couple of comments at the bottom of a check-in, maybe I'd use it more. But but at the same time, um, it's, very, it's unclear to me exactly what they're trying to, to position the service for. It was a game before. Now it's a game with Yelp-like qualities or, I mean, are they trying to, trying to turn it into something like Facebook and we're, we're creating a temporary community? Um, I, I'd like to see more direction from them so that I know exactly how they're positioning their product. All right. Uh, there's been a lot of stories out there about Google Maps for iOS and whether the Google Maps app might get turned down by Apple because it duplicates functionality and reading the tea leaves that, hey, Apple doesn't actually recommend any apps that use the Google Maps API. Talk some sense to us, Sarah. What's actually going to happen with the Google Map? Well, it depends on if you like The Guardian or CNET better. <laughs> they have two different versions of the same story. And yes, this is the whole story of, well, I remember when Apple got rid of YouTube? That was sucky. But then YouTube came along with a standalone app and Apple accepted that. Hmm, okay. But they hate each other, right? These two companies, they'll never play along, not when it comes to maps. Yesterday, uh, The Guardian had quoted some sources from inside Google, familiar with mapping plans and the matter, say that they are not optimistic that Apple is ever going to approve a dedicated Google Maps app for iOS. Uh, they say the app is in development, so it's not as if Google isn't trying, uh, supposedly possibly ready to ship by the end of the year but that it's very unlikely that Apple would ever approve it. Now, you write an article like that, and people say, oh, no, people at Google know that Apple's not going to approve it. That's like, How could Apple do that? Oh, they're just, people will, will rail against the company. Such bad mojo for all of our users. How could they do that to their loyal fans? CNET says, listen, this is, sounds like, to me, like what developers say anytime they make an app that may or may not be approved in the App Store because Apple is fickle and not only doesn't approve things, sometimes for very sort of muddy reasons, but can pull an app, a very popular app that people know and love because they change their terms of service and that's the way it goes. So CNET says there's really no reason to believe that this is not just a developer saying, gosh, you know, there might be a little something in there that we might have to tweak and this is just Apple being Apple. Plus, when the Apple Maps fallout happened, we got an apology from Tim Cook. We got a, here's some other places that would give you maps that might be superior to our own because you want, we want you to be happy. 
Google was listed in that list. The web, wasn't... the web version of Google. Sure, mind you. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't Google even like Nokia. a good version of Google, but they, sure. but they listed them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're aware that Google Maps is something that you had. You don't have it anymore, but you do still have it, and we recommend that you use it if you so desire. And even since then, Street View has been rolled out. So, the web version is is it's not the app, but it's pretty darn close. So there's that. And then there's also the, the obvious part is that Apple doesn't want to have bad publicity. It took Apple a while to uh, get Google Voice into the iOS store. Users were upset about that. Users complained about it. Still didn't happen. But then the FCC got involved. The app appeared. And there really hasn't been any issue. There's really, really been nothing to point to uh, in the past. Apple saying, yeah, if it comes from Google, we're not approving it. So CNET says, everybody calm down. This is probably just par for the course. Yeah, I mean, in, think. in the apology, I mean, they even mentioned other apps to get maps. So th it's not like Apple's got a thing against maps in general. They need a platform that makes them look good anyway. There's no reason to say, okay, our maps stink, but we don't want anybody else to have maps on our on our device. That's that's their ecosystem. They need iOS to succeed. Without Google Maps, that'd be a real, real dumb move, actually. So I don't doubt that this application is going to get passed through the, the app store, no problem. It's just a matter of time. When is this thing going to be finished? When is it going to be out there? Because... We've seen Google just at the ready. They had their apps at the ready, like Google Voice. They were waiting for the longest time for the terms to change. They finally came out with that. But as I think the reports were Google was caught off guard. They didn't expect to lose their, their uh, contract with Apple so early. So they don't have anything ready. So when that's ready, I'm expecting to see those maps. It would, it would not make any sense for Apple to turn down a Google Maps app, would it, Father Robert? I, 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 can't, I can't see a way where that is a positive outcome for anybody. Absolutely not. No, I think Sarah's right. This is just, this is Apple being Apple. We've seen it before. If this was a, a an unusual case of a long process, then maybe I'd be worried, but we've seen this time and time again. I, I have a more nuanced question, and it's, it's something I, I haven't been able to get any tech pundit to answer, and that is, what does Google really get having an app? I mean, yeah, they get Mindshare. They get to be on the, the i whatever, the iPad, the iPhone, but they're not selling ads in the app. And it doesn't link to any of the devices like it does on, say, an Android device or even a Windows phone device. So what good is it for them to help Apple get a good mapping program on an iOS device? Well, it well, could sell ads in the map. They did on the now YouTube they, app. Now, now they can. Now they, they couldn't can. before. But, I mean, Apple's been, they've really been trying to crank down on that because mm. everyone knows they want to develop their own content selling system, advertised selling system. I mean, couldn't you see a Google exec at some point saying, why are we doing this? It, before it was Apple. Apple made the app for their iOS device using our data. But why should we go through the expense of creating an app for them if they don't want to do it? The way I've seen it is that I've seen the Google apps almost as gateway to Android. Because the thing is, when you find out these applications kind of work and you can't switch your default unless you jailbreak, you go, Google Voice works really well and Google Maps works really well and YouTube works really well. Wait a second. If I'm using all these Google apps, why am I not just going to Android? Because I know I've, I've had that experience of switching devices and go, oh, this works a lot better over here, and you're more likely to try it out. So to me, I think this is more, it's a, even it's kind of like pre keeping a mind share, keeping the presence known. And it would be just foolish to knock out, you know, 25% of the market and go, oh, yeah, we're not paying attention to you guys. It, it doesn't even have to be about Android, just about Google in general. Like, mm -hmm. sure, Android is, the, is, is, is an awesome direction and... and perfectly legitimate uh, but Google just wants people to use Google and so if they don't put maps on iOS then people are using Google less they're thinking about Google less and they're less likely to use it and they're driving people essentially into the Apple Maps because they're like well none of these other things are really very good uh, and they get used to using something else they might use the Bing Maps on iOS which are there uh, so so I think they kind of have to because they want to keep Google Maps as the idea of the best map app that you can use. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of about five or six years ago when um, I, I was running a youth group down in San Jose and there were a bunch of our young adults who had iPods. And iTunes on a Windows machine back then was just, it was horrible. It was a terrible, terrible experience. One of them got a MacBook and it worked so well. And they're like, wait a minute, why aren't we just using MacBooks? This, this, this would work better if we had a MacBook. I'm, so yeah, in that context, I could see that working. That, that's, that's the advantage of having the mind share. But that's also assuming that at some point, an iOS user will pick up an Android tablet or pick up an Android phone uh, and, and to be able to experience the full Google experience. That, that's why I said it doesn't even have to be the Android Ed game. As long as they get them to use Google yeah. Maps on their, on their MacBook, Google wins. Uh, let's finish up. It's Election Day in the United States. Uh, there was a hurricane last week you most likely heard about. 
uh, which is disrupting voting in the East Coast. And displaced persons in New Jersey are being allowed to vote by fax and email. Now, these both have problems, but the email one is getting a lot more attention than the fax one. Uh, but here's how it works. By 5 p.m., uh, by either email or fax today, New Jersey residents uh, have to fill out an electronic ballot application uh, and email or fax it to the New Jersey Voting Authority. Then, uh, along with the ballot, electronic transmission sheet and a secrecy waiver will be mailed back to the applicant. Email or fax your completed electronic ballot and verification materials, and I don't know what those are, as detailed in the voting instructions, by 8 p.m. tonight. So at the latest, you can request a ballot is at 5 p.m., and then you should get one turned around quickly, and you have until 8 p.m. to file it. Then, afterwards, by U.S. mail, you have to email, you have to send your entire completed application to your local county clerk, print it out. So that's sort of your checksum, right? You're sending this ballot, sort of like a provisional ballot through email or fax. Then you're sending your application. Uh, and I suppose the idea is they can get, they can later go, if there's a recount or if there's controversy, they can go and verify that an application was actually mailed in for those votes that are sent in by email or fax. Now, millions of security concerns immediately. We, we mentioned them in the news fuse. DDoSs, uh, email not being secure. Emails can get intercepted. Attachments could be modified uh, either on their way or at the source. Uh, the votes may not be secret anymore, which is a, an issue. How concerned are you, Iaz, that this would actually be a problem? Well, I mean, it seems like because this is kind of haste, hastily put together, that there could be a, it could bring up the concerns right away. Uh, I don't know what percentage of people are going to even use this and if it's going to matter when it comes to this particular state. Like, how does it vote normally? I mean, if this was a swing state, I could see people really freaking out. I mean, they're obviously concerned, but this is New Jersey. I don't, I don't know their record offhand. I'm going to assume they're probably a blue state. If, if it goes that way... I the, uh, the, well, as far as the election, it looks like the Democrats are going to win the presidential uh, electoral votes in New Jersey by a comfortable margin. So it's likely not going to make a difference in the outcome of the election, and it is a small number of people. But it's definitely great to have this dialogue open because this is some kind of way to get you know your vote in if we can see what the problems are and figure out a system that makes it a lot easier to do this. Because I always found it strange that it's on a working day. It's on Tuesday, the election day. It's not on a Saturday or a time period over a week like other countries have. Like there, it's, it's this thing where you have to go to work maybe or they're not necessarily getting a day off. If you can get a different way to not be standing in line to, to get your vote in, if we can figure out okay, well, this is how we had to do with an emergency. How can we set up a, a proper system? It's a good start, but I don't know what's going to happen with this one. Father Robert, is this a, a good test case, do you think? It's, you know, I, we didn't want know. the test case, but now, we, now we're forced to have one. I'm, I'm so afraid because it does seem like it was kludged together. They, they did this out of necessity because of the devastation that's taking place on the East Coast. But at the same time, it's kind of exciting. I mean, it, did we need a disaster to, to force an actual test case of of real-time electronic voting. Now, given, uh, granted, a lot of people are going to look at this and going to say, this is not actual vote, electronic voting because it's it's an email system and you, you have to send in the, the application later on. But it's the step in the right direction. Uh, and especially in, a, in a, a, a an area where it's not going to affect the overall election. I think it's... It's a good thing, right? I mean, if we can get more people to vote, if we can get more people to, to vote in a process that's easier to do, that's, that's always good, yes? Yeah, uh, well, and, and uh, I think this could prove to be a benefit because it's small enough, as I has pointed out, that it might not really make a difference. It might not be controversial enough to, uh, to cause an uproar in, in at least the electoral votes, uh, but it is going to prove to be a test case Sarah, I mean, this this could end up being the thing that people look at and say, well, the things that were done right, the things that were done wrong can be improved upon. Yeah, we're sort of forced to get a relatively small sample to do a little a little political science experiment here. <laughs> if it all goes well, then the, the 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 well, the people in charge of these sorts of things are going to be forced to say, well, hold on a second. Nothing actually went wrong here. This is something that uh, could really help bring voting numbers up, which is a problem, certainly in this country. And, okay, now let's look at how we can make it secure because we, we, we're, we're now on the day that email voting is possible. So it can't just be impossible anymore. It's clearly possible. Maybe it doesn't work that well. We don't really know yet. And uh, we can pick it apart afterwards and talk about what went wrong and what needs to be stronger. But it is possible as of this point. So 
that is exciting to me too. Anytime I can email and not have to walk somewhere. If done securely, yeah. On the couch, voting from the couch, into it. Audio listeners, that was a thumbs up if you didn't see that. We have lots of antiquated voting laws in this country, though, uh, so it's kind of weird that you can walk up and not even have to show ID to vote with paper, but we're all concerned if it's over a fax machine or an email, and that brings us to our randomizer. Randomizer. All Things D has a story up. Lauren Good, uh, who's been on the show a bunch of time. We love Lauren. Uh, pointing out that it's actually against the law in some states in the United States, not all states, to take a picture of your ballot either at the polling place or even if you're not at the polling place, if it's filled out. I was reading this because I think one of, was it Justin Robert Young who actually was live streaming his, his vote? Right. Or looking at his ballot? I was like, isn't that illegal? And now, I, he I, was voting on a Florida ballot. I don't see Florida listed as, as one of the, uh, the states that has an issue here. It's funny because I was thinking, like, what materials can I take in with me so if I want to like remember the propositions or whatever I'm going to vote for, I want to have notes. Like a person in North Carolina had his phone taken away because he wanted to look at the list of, of candidates because you're not allowed to take photographs of your ballot because it's going to it's going to cause some kind of fraud issue. Well, it's the the not allowing photographs of the ballot at the polling place is is just a ban on taking photos or videos. They don't want people to feel like they're being observed. It's a, it's a part of the secret ballot, right? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yes. But uh, if you're if you're not at the polling place, the idea is that if you take a picture of your filled out ballot, then that's you're doing that to prove that you voted a particular way, which is used to get the money that people use to buy your vote. So the safe bet is to not take photos of your of your ballot. Well, look at your your yeah. That obviously is the safe bet, or at least an unfilled out ballot might be okay. Never take a picture at a polling place, and don't take a picture of a filled in ballot. Would be the safe. So don't bet. Come into other but it depends booths. on where you are. In California, you can you can take a picture of your filled in ballot. Uh, it looks like in in Florida, you can you can take care of it. So we're, so Justin's not going to be hauled off to prison. We think. But this is just a sign of the times, isn't it? Not I mean, that. we we take pictures of our desserts. We take pictures when our dinners arrive. Why wouldn't we take a picture of our ballot? I would. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's a, exactly. I mean, I wouldn't take a picture of my filled in ballot because I still because like you're that. embarrassed by some of your decisions. Yeah, you know. I mean, I voted for Roseanne. Oh, sorry. oh whoa! Uh, no, it's. I I I was raised in a very old fashioned like you. My my dad would never tell anyone who he voted for. We all knew who he voted for, but it was a matter of principle, and so I still have that kind of knee jerk like, no, no, I'm not going to show my vote. Let's secret mm. ballot mm -hmm. should be kept secret. There's an argument that secret ballot actually. Uh, is bad because then you can pretend that you voted one way and not the other, and that 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 can be an issue in 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 influence peddling. Uh, but I don't know. I I I think these are kind of you know what. If I buy someone's vote, I want to make sure they voted the way I told them to. Right. You know what? Don't sell your vote, folks. Instead, use our third sponsor for today's show to raise cash. There's no need to sell a vote when you can sell your old gadgets at Gazelle.com. <laughs> Go, you want to sell something. Vote for who so, you think should win. Then go to your garage, pull out the old gadgets, go to gazelle.com and get cash for your used gadgets. It's very easy. Uh, it's it's like ordering off of one of those menus at a fast food restaurant. You see the picture of the thing you have, and then you see which model of that particular thing, and then you see your carrier. All of a sudden, you're locked in for 30 days with a quote. Now, you're not locked in. You actually don't have to sell the thing. It's risk-free. But they're locked in. Gazelle says, we're going to golden handcuff ourselves. Once we make you an offer, that offer is locked in for 30 days. So go to gazelle.com, get that offer, lock it in. Uh, they'll pay for the shipping, ship off your gadgets, and then uh, they'll pay you by check or PayPal uh, within a couple of days of them getting the device. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. Uh, go sell your used gadgets today. It's simple. I've done it a bunch of times, uh, and we appreciate Gazelle's support of Tech News Today. What's on the calendar, Sarah? Well, Tom, the Linux version of Valve's Steam Games download shop goes live today. NVIDIA has revealed this. AT&T is launching uh, not only the $99 Nokia Lumia 920, but also the $49 Lumia 820 on November 9th. If you're waiting eagerly for the release date of HTC's 8X, it's arriving sometime before Thanksgiving. So, hey, that's in the next two weeks. And the Verizon App Store that you probably aren't using is getting shut down uh, by March 2013. I won't miss it. We talked about that app store. That was the, it's better than a kick in the head. <laughs> it is. is that what we called Just it? Just barely. Just barely better than a kick <laughs> well, in the head. Well, now all I have is a kick in the head. There right. you go. At least by next March. <laughs> but you know what else you have? What? Incoming messages. Incoming message. There's one now. I uh, got a voicemail on why one caller thinks hardware companies might be getting into software more. 
Hey guys, last week you were talking about more hardware design, more hardware companies getting into software, more software companies getting into hardware, and why this is happening. I thought I could provide a little bit of insight. A lot of it happens to deal with the reality of the nature of the chips themselves. You have all these chips that are consolidating into system on chip platforms like ARM platforms, Intel's Clover Trail, where you have more and more components built directly into the devices themselves. The side effect there is that there's a lot more pipe dependencies between those items so that the software needs to be updated too. When you have one company doing all that, it makes it a lot easier. So, Father Robert, host of This Week in Enterprise Tech, could you, is that is that fair? I mean, it, there's a lot logical sense to it, but then my reaction is, but that's different software than the kind of software we're talking about. We're talking about operating systems. He's talking about firmware and and socks. Right. Uh, the reason why you build the system on the chip is because the more components you put within the same piece of silicon, the faster your, your interconnects are going to be, the faster the overall performance. But by the time you get to the operating system, all of that translation is done for you. There's a hardware ab abstraction layer. So the software that we're talking about doesn't need to be aware of that it just knows the system's there it's not actually writing for that he's speaking about the lower level software okay gotcha uh, but but uh, but a good thought good thought we got an email from ross in montreal about apple not releasing specific numbers on ipad sales models uh companies like apple are not so fond of releasing model by model sales figures as this data is usually considered commercially sensitive. If you're a competitor planning to build 2 million devices before launching your product, it's terribly useful from a supply chain management perspective, at least, to know that white tablets sell better than black ones, and the 64 gigabyte storage capacity model has a comparatively small but dedicated following. Oops, did I just give away the secret sauce? That's actually what he wrote. Anyway, the exact breakdown is pretty useful to competitors Apple probably sees the iPad as one product with 24 variants and not as an iPad and iPad pad mini. Thanks for that insight, Ross. Thank you, Ross. Good to, good to hear from Ross C. Brown. He's a longtime listener to both uh, Tech News Today and uh, Buzz Out Loud. So uh, it's, it's, it's nice to get some expert opinions. We have the smartest audience in the freaking world. Uh, you guys are the best. And that's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Thanks to everybody for submitting in our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. Helps us figure out what stories we want to cover each day. Father Robert Ballister, we've mentioned it a few times, not as a plug. This Week in Enterprise Tech, though, it's awesome. This Week in Enterprise Tech, we know it as Twiet. We film every Monday at noon live come on by and uh, jump in the chat room and meet some of the most brilliant people and trolls you'll ever meet <laughs> some of the most brilliant trolls you'll ever meet that's it for this episode you can find us on the web twit.tv slash tnt you can email us tnt at twit.tv or give us a call leave us a voicemail 260 tnt show rich demuro joins us tomorrow we'll see you then